Let's see if you can, okay? So, you see, it just breaks. Okay, okay this one is maybe a. We go on with neutrino mass, as we said. And before I go on, I will summarize what we've learned up to now. We spent... Yes. Well, the light is on. It's making... This noise is coming from there, is that? No, oh, there's the print. No, it's on. I think it's okay. Um, remember, I studied that actually spent some time on. Uh, let's see. Thanks. Yeah, I think this is better, sure. Um, I started with an effective approach, what we call which is sort of very different from what we were doing in the standard model. In the standard model we were developing a fundamental theory, a gate theory kind of, which is normalizable, which all the interactions are dimension 4, in which you have physical messengers of the forces in question. Okay, why did we do that? We did it because the underlying theory of weak interaction, based on the uh, Fermi Hamiltonian on Lagrangian, which we would write G mu weak, G mu weak bar, and then G mu weak, it has to be bar because this carries charge, right? Weak interactions carry charge. Would be written as nu bar, gamma mu e plus P bar, gamma mu n. And of course everything is left-handed, but this is now a detail. Okay, what, what we wanted actually, we wanted to probe this, we wanted to enter into this, and we wanted to understand where it derives its origin. But as it is, however, imagine, <coughs> imagine that I stay at low energies, then this is the right approach, and it was for decades. Okay, why? It tells me unless I can reach the energies, we decided at the end that this can be obtained from the following. Fundamental Lagrangian. And we are doing that because it turned out that this is the correct theory. We managed both theoretical and experimentalists to make sense out of this approach. Had we not been able, or even if we are able, the first step, however, if you want to be a fundamental theory, it's a good idea that you know what you should expect, what it has to be. So you try to describe the underlying physics of what you are after in an effective way. This is, you will hear a lot about it as you go along, effective field theory. And it's used very often because we have no idea what is lying beyond the standard model. So it may be good from time to time, before you have a fundamental theory to work on, to say, oh, let me see what happens. And this is the, why we use this Weinberg approach. We said that whatever we call it, we can call it Yukawa or neutrino effective. We said it has to have, and we wrote it in a symmetric form it looked like. We said we have to take two doublets and anti-symmetrize them. We knew that we had to do the charge conjugation, it's just because of Lorentz. And then I take the same term here. Divided by what I call lambda nu. <coughs> Notice that I could put a coupling at some point I did put a coupling. But actually since I don't know what the scale is, it says, I don't really believe that this is some physical scale. This is just an effective way of writing. It's more convenient, as Weinberg wrote it, to write the way Fermi wrote it. Whatever you come from, it turned out in the 
the G Fermi of a square root of 2 is this in this approach. But what I knew that this is some. Um, we could have also written it to 1 over m Fermi squared. It was a number that was figured out from experiment. Now, this could have come, of course, from some scalar interaction. You didn't know a priori. So this is in the gauge approach. Imagine that in scalar, then there would have been some Yukawa coupling over m scalar squared with a factor of 8 or not, I don't know. A priori thing here, this would be a scalar. Since you don't know where it's going to come from, or it could come from more complicated interaction, this is very useful, we said. Now, it's not only that this gives me bookkeeping. It, it gives me a little more. It tells me, for example, that if I have a process in which neutron decays into a proton, plus new bar, it tells me that we better water processes. For example, if I get new bar somehow and hit a proton, I may get neutron and the positron. This is the same interaction. It's hidden here. This is very useful, as you know. Why? I can see neutrino like that. All I need to get a lot of these anti neutrinos. And then I will look at what they do, and I hit something with that, right? And what I do, I hit a detector in which there are a lot of protons, and the cheapest detector with their protons is what? So, the use of the Fermi theory is great here because I can think of other physical processes, okay? And if there are more generations, then of course there will be not just neutrino and electron, there will be ones that discover a muon. Therefore, I'll have a muon decay or may have some scatterings, right? So there is a dynamical use in the theory. It's not just the bookkeeping of writing a particular uh, uh, new physics. Whereas I would argue that here, unfortunately, the message is opposite. It's useful in a sense because from here what I learned that m nu must be on my runner time. And it's given by v squared over lambda nu. But beyond that, I learned nothing. There is no new dynamics. All I got is a neutrino mass. And a very tiny Yukawa coupling. Well, there was a Yukawa coupling, but we said, forget it, okay, it was 10 to the minus 10, 11, 12, I don't remember. So the message is kind of sad. And this is why I would argue that we have to go beyond this. It is our task to try to figure it out because we are after new physics. You and I, if you want to work, we keep being physicists, we want to see something new. We at LSC and the next collider. Notice this V square. And it tells you the way the Fermi tells you. Fermi tells you, I don't care where you come from. Gate, scale, or whatever, you should always get this. It's going to be one over some M square. You figure it out what it means for your coupling and your mass. Weinberg tells you the same thing. I don't care where you come from. It's going to be proportional to V square, which is MW square. Why is here V square, can you guess? without even doing any calculation. Can we understand that? Well, remember what we said, the neutrino mass, which can be only a Majorana form because there is only left-handed neutrino, is a triplet under SU2. T3 is minus a half plus minus a half. This is minus one. Whatever I do, I must get effectively a triplet. And V, the vacuum expectation value, is of course the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs doublet. I need to take two such doublets to get a triplet. I will always have V squared. I don't care what model you use. And, and I'll give you examples of what we could do. We will always get V squared. So then the next uh, project, we said, okay, let's see where it comes from. And we said the simplest possibility to start with Yukawa neutrino, which would be LL bar. We call it Yukawa Dira. Phi tilde nu R. We added a right handed neutrino, something had to be added. And the 
rule, the golden rule, the tacit rule that you and I have, was write all the gauge invariant interaction, told us that I also have to include the Majorana master for this U state. State or states, there'll be more of them with more generation. I had to do that because this is gauge invariant. UR is a single. It's a ghost particle until you write this. Now it became something. Then we introduce, I said it is more convenient to work with the fields of the same helicity, therefore I introduced a left-handed charge conjugate of the right-handed neutrino. So notice the strange thing that we call it right-handed neutrino, but we more often work with its left-handed brother, sister, whatever it is, you, well, I know, entire, entire brother, <laughs> it's uh, opposite what he is, okay. Why? because I want to understand the, 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 the mixing, the mass matrix that I obtain, and it's more convenient that I work with the fields of the same chirality. Okay. And so we rearrange this. Right? First we notice that phi is the unitary phi, which is V plus H. And from here, You remember what we got? Well, I remind you, we wrote this became M Dirac over 2, new L transpose CNL. Please check your notes if you don't remember. Use NL transpose C new L plus M over 2, NL transpose CNL plus commission code. Very M Dirac was Yukawa Dira times V. Notice the name I insisted Yukawa Dira. This is not an effective Yukawa interaction, okay? This is just the 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 original term of the Dirac time, okay, that that couples my neutrino to this new very heavy particle. I imagine it to be very heavy. This is a CISO approach to neutrino mass where you say that it's natural since this is a new scale of a new physics. It's the same reason as Weinberg. I don't want to introduce more states to the light states of the standard model. Okay. Its mass is not coming from the symmetry breaking of SU2 plus U1, so we believe it's more natural. As nice as it sounds, oh, let me just remind you how you, how you know that it will end up with a little practice. This term has a commission conjugate which is made out of noir bar. But noir bar is NL. And the only way the Majorana Maastrom can look is N transpose N. So you know, you, you, okay, you can manipulate that, but you think, okay, it's come, coming from here. And where will this come from? Well, look at it here, for example. Or maybe better, the Hermitian conjugate. I'm sorry, there is a Hermitian conjugate right of this, which is nu r bar, but nu r bar is nl. From here, no, from here we are about to recapitulate what we've done. From here we said that there is a mass matrix for nu l and nl, which has a form md M D M. Factor of two is fictitious because there is actually half in the kinetic energy when we go into the Majorana basis. This is the first homework, which I will write anyway in a second. So this is what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to do and this is what I have to teach you, and this is a must for us to, to, to understand the, the, the the task, the challenge, is what Glesho, Weinberg and other people faced when they wanted to probe the Fermi interaction. There was new physics to them, they wanted to know what it's coming from, from the fundamental fields. And now we, you and I are trying to do the same. And we actually have a reasonably simple picture here. 
that says if m is much bigger than md, then I get a C so mechanism why the light neutrino mass obviously from the determinant m nu would be minus m dirac square over m which is minus u kava dirac square v square over m I should always do that, I should check myself I'm told by Weinberg I have to get v squared. Doesn't matter what I started with, okay? I'm okay because I got v squared. And now, of course, just in the case of Fermi, we was just a scale. Here it tells you that there is a physical coupling of the new particle, and of course, it's mass, which will enter into the. Was this everything clear? That this is what we done last time on Wednesday. Can you guess? I don't know whether I'll do it. I think I'll include it in the homework. I think. Maybe it's more fun if you do it. If I take more generations, can you guess what would I get here? So just to see uh, if I go to, to more generations. This will be M would be still be as some M N. We can do that from time to time just to remind ourselves that M is M N. This will be a, uh, some M Dirac would become a matrix. You agree? Can you guess what will be here? Obviously, it will be M Dirac, but precisely M Dirac, or in other words. Let me be let me be clear. I will get a CISO formula when I generalize. I will get a neutrino mass matrix, you agree? If you wish to always be clear what is going on, call it my Rana, just to emphasize that this is of course of my Rana nature. So this matrix would be, how would it look? It would have M Dirac, there will be a minus sign, there will be one over M N. This is what I had had there, obviously, and there will be M Dirac. And this will be the matrix of this type, nu y transpose c nu j and nu ij. Notice that this is symmetric. Why is this symmetric? Because c is anti-symmetric. This is manifestly, this is minus nu j transpose c transpose nu y because the anti-commute. But this is nu j transpose C nu y. Therefore, this is equal to m nu transpose ij. Oh, why don't I write it from here? m nu is equal to m nu transpose. My random mass matrix is asymmetric. Good to know that. Very often. It so obviously, MDs arbitrary in general. What you get here, and it's a little exercise, you would get M direct transpose. It's a convention of what I call M direct, what M direct transpose. We have to see to be in agreement with other people because we could call MD the, <laughs> the, the transpose of MD, okay? You and I can decide that. So the formula really looks like this. I'll just quote it today, I'm not sure, I think I'll include it for the homework. If I don't, we can derive it in the class. But I think you will learn more if you do it on your own. And you know, remember here we said that there will be a mixing, which is M Dirac over M. Obviously, what is a mixing? It's a ratio of the of the diagonal to the diagonal element. And it will generalize to the matrix. There will be some theta matrix here, which will be, and now we have to be careful about the order. Then we have to <laughs> be clear what we mean by that. So I won't even write it because this will be 1 over mn, 
times m dirac or m dirac times 1 over mn and so on, okay? Let's not talk about it before we actually see what we mean in a multi-generation case, okay? But what is crucial? And I, and I want, to, want you to take my word for that. That the form would necessarily, anyway you understand it would have to be like that because it has to be symmetric. Because I was critical of the seesaw, saying the following. It sounds great. I can sort of understand the fundamental origin and nature of neutrino mass, and I can tell you why it's small, because there is some heavy guy there. But unless I can produce it and see its properties, what did I really learn? There is another reason to be uh, critical. Notice what Weinberg, what is a great success of the Stellar model is the following. When we speak of charge fermion masses, it says the following. If you give me the mass, I can immediately compute Yukawa. And then it's just the homework for first year graduate students to compute the Higgs decay. And I can immediately compute then the rate. And I'll get something like m Higgs over 8. I don't remember now. G over 2. M fermion over mw squared. When Higgs is sufficiently heavy. Something like this. And this is very important. It tells you. I have a way of probing. I, I know how to probe this, what you are claiming, you can tell Weinberg. Okay, you are saying that you get the mass from Weinberg and Jim in this manner? Well, I can check that. What would that mean here? Remember what I said on Wednesday because of the mixing? Because of the mixing theta, which is m dirac over mn, over m, it's a call. I found out that through that mixing, there is a coupling of this time. Do you remember that? Now the problem is I said that the coupling is very small, so I, I would like to use this coupling to produce them, but coupling is very small. Right, remember that theta square is m nu over m n. And that was very small, because m nu is so light. So, but imagine that somehow I can produce this guy. Imagine that I had a magic stick and I could produce it, what would I learn? Then then I could have very interesting decays. N would decay into an electron and W plus. Now this is a crack. This we leave it as an exercise for you. This I believe is a beautiful exercise. It can also decay into a bar plus W minus. Why? Because n actually is half times n and half times n bar. In order to work with a four-component notation, we said we will always introduce Majorana states. For example, which will be nl plus c nl bar transpose. Which, if you wish, this is nu r. Is nu r plus c nu r bar transpose. Because nl is this. That's a matter. I like this notation better because it was easier for me to know if the mass matrix. If you're more familiar with the right handed neutrino, use this. I don't care what you use. So, the important thing is that the particle, the physical particle, the Majorana state, is half time neutrino, half time anti neutrino, half time n, half time anti n. 
which means that they should decay half time into an electron, half time into a positron. And that means if you and I can produce an, we could actually check directly the Majorana nature. This is the way of finding out that the particle is Majorana. This you could use at a polarity if you produce it, okay. This was suggested with my friend Kyung in 83. I'll tell you how we imagined that we could produce sand a little later. But the point is that this is the only way, as I know, which is feasible, which you and I will know that this actually particle is Majorana directly. Not so some indirect physical process, but we would see it once you produce it. You will get inside the guy. <coughs> of course, it would require that you get precisely half. So if there are thousands of electrons, there should be thousands. Was it wrong? Uh, there's something maybe which is a little bit not clear. Uh, because we know that the neutrino, and even if it's made with Majorana, it's um, very light. So neutrino is light, but then it's heavy. In the CISO picture, and it's very heavy. You see, the CISO picture tells you uh, uh, what, what we are after now. W what does the standard model picture tell you? That the Fermi operator, this very formal way of writing at low energies interaction, comes from the existence of a W boson as a messenger of the force. So if I want to probe the Fermi theory, I have to find the W and study all its properties. So if I want to understand the origin of the neutrino mass, and I believe that it's of the CISO types, I'm pursuing the CISO picture, it's become the mechanism of understanding neutrino mass. That means I have to get this guy in and I have to see inside, I have to see its properties. Yes. The way we did for WMZ. This neutrino here, is it, is it the normal neutrino? No. No, no, no. No, remember, it's the guy which is very heavy. This MD is very tiny. You should think of the following, okay? MD is zero in the first approximation. When I say that something is much bigger than something, I'm saying this is zero in the first approximation. This is how you should think. The first approximation of Reno is massless. Yes, but... Um, and this is some very heavy neutral lepton, whose mass we said should be on the order of 100 GeV or bigger, coming out from physics beyond the standard model. Or maybe 10 to the 5 GeV, maybe even Weinberg will tell you, forget looking for this guy. It weighs 10 to the 13 GeV, he will tell you, and he tells you. He says it publicly, he says, you know, don't waste the time, it's going to be a waste of time. I'm saying, no, please do it, because we may learn something profound. We may do what he managed to do, and his body is for the standard model. But this is a new physical particle that has nothing to do with neutrino. Nothing. Just, just cut a little bit. I mean, I didn't understand this. Here we are saying that... Um, the new particle is mixed mix of um, anti-neutrino and neutrino and... Well, I said this language in neutrino, I said this is a language which is very, we call it right-handed neutrino, but it's a terrible language. You know why we call it the right-handed neutrino? Because it, it couples to a light neutrino through this right-handed component in the Dirac right case. Neutrino, where did the name neutrino come from, right? They want to call it a neutron, but a neutron was found in 1932, and this guy ended up being light, so Fermi says, let me call it a little neutron, right? Neutrino is something very light. So the name neutrino here does not really apply. And you say new, heavy, emphasizes on heavy, neutral lepton. Unfortunately, it's often called right-handed neutrino. The name is misleading for two reasons. There is nothing right-handed about it. It's both right-handed and left-handed. There is no right-handed particle. There is always the, the, the anti-state which is left-handed, okay? We need a different, three different and electrons yes. for each and yes. Yes. yes, of course. There is now a new... Uh, and you're asking yourself, why would I add three right-handed neutrinos, you know, or do I really need three of them? You could say, well, maybe I'll try with two of them. I can come back to that question. 
Uh, strictly speaking, I could actually do with two of them. If I, we have a heavier neutrino, the correspondent yes. lepton should be. Right, the corresponding should, should be, so there should be at least two heavy neutral so leptons. By the way, we know today that neutrinos are massive. But actually, strictly speaking, there are three neutrinos, but we don't know that all three are massive. No. There are two mass differences, if you remember. There, yes. are, there is atmospheric neutrino oscillation, yeah. and there is a solar neutrino oscillation. So there are two mass differences. In principle, one could be massless. Unless we measure directly neutrino mass, the actual value, we won't know from neutrino oscillations ever. We'll have a little, let's say, uh, why don't we have one lecture reminding you of oscillations, which because some of the details you may have forgotten, I know that he does it, he does it probably more depth than I would do. And he ought to do that, this is his bread and butter, Alex says. Thinking about, you know, the way neutrinos oscillate. And all the relevant details. Does the okay. hierarchy of the masses is relevant to the final? S in some level? sense, well, yes, you know, because you can tell me, look, there is some hierarchy here. So now you can tell me, does it come from here or it comes from here? You see how the CISO mechanism is actually not telling us anything? Because I have no way of telling you anything about them, dear. I, I tell you, I tell you now, in a second, that it's worse than, than, than what I just said. But before that, I just want to see, because my phone is still, I, can, I don't want him unhappy, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> going home today and I don't want your weekend to be spoiled because you <laughs> this is not a, this, this, this is just a name we did you know why we called it a name because we coupled it to the neutrino we coupled it like this new L bar new R you know when I speak of left handed neutrino in weak interactions I call it left handed because it, it the way it couples by our convention to electron but remember there is also a new CR I call it an anti-neutrino because it's coupled to the positron. Mm -hmm. but it's all a question of convention. There is always one and the other. When we speak of this particle, chirality is defined in some way how they interact. So the original definition of this guy, which is actually a new particle. Why is it a new particle? Because there is n, new r, new r, and the r. There is a huge mass term, and this is zero in the first approximation, I'm saying. So think of it the following, neutrino is massless, and for all practical purposes it's going to be massless because you will never see it in any experiment at LAC or anywhere, unless you are looking for some very tiny phenomenon sensitive to this crazy small number of less than an electron volt, billion times lighter than the uh, than the proton, million times lighter than the electron, that's zero for all practical purposes. And on the other hand is a heavy particle, which we've never seen. To us it's some particle that is above the W. And actually I expect it to have this spectacular decays. It would be great for us to produce it once again, because we could see this beautiful thing that Majorana imagined, the possibility of particles that at the same time that they are sort of hermaphrodite. We have three generations now. Yes. Should we some CP violation also, and we will. So it's a very interesting question. What will happen now? The mixing angles. We'll talk about the mixing angles. I'll, I'll have to remind you of the mixings in the. So I have a lecture when we discuss oscillations, where of course it comes from the analog of Kobayashi Maskawa, PMNS, okay. where P stands for Takoro, MNS and Nakata, and so on. The Japanese go well. Let's talk about it in the future, of course, that would be crucial. Uh, it's the only thing that we have at the moment, by the way. We have not yet seen neutrino mass. We have seen the effect of neutrino mass, but we have not seen neutrino mass. Neutrino mass somehow would be measuring one way or another, right? It, it's, it's this dispersion relation, okay, whatever we can imagine. It's, it's we should keep talking about it. It is a matter of time to measure neutrino mass. One is sure, everybody would, you know, I... Or we should come what can I do, you know, all I can do at this point is... To put
put the money where my mouth is, as you say. I am willing to bet a good deal of my money, claiming precisely it's a matter of short time. It is 10 or some year we will see in a train of us. But then, there are these famous words when Pauli was told. Pauli says, oh, forgive me for having introduced neutrino. He says, I made a mistake. We will never observe that, Pauli. In 1931, I think, he says, 32, when he became aware how weakly this coupled really. Then they found in 1956, they sent him a telegram, and Pauli says, well, everything comes to him or her who knows how to wait. Neutrino physics is about patience, okay? I've been waiting for such a long time, so I... I I can't imagine that I won't know. You you, you, you can imagine you spend all your life trying to understand certain phenomena. And the other would be grand unification. I spend a lot of time thinking about that. So I, for one... So this may be just the, you know, the kind of optimism of, of emotional need. A priori, we don't know. Because there are only two ways of seeing neutrino mass that we are practically thinking of now. One is that looking at the end point of the energies, electron spectrum. I have to remind you of that, and the other is neutrino of a beta decay. I have to be a little more precise, uh, at least half a lecture, next week or the week after, where we try to put the numbers into, into what I mean by this. There is a new experiment looking into there. There is a series of experiments in neutrino double beta decay. There is a Katrin, a very interesting experiment looking at the at the direct mass in this in the endpoint spectrum. But let me come to that. I don't want to, I, I I have to follow my line of thought to that. And the the one is that, however, in order to claim that I have something analogous to this gentleman here. I have to do the following. That I, I have to do the following here. What do I have to? What is the input in the charge fermion thing? The input is the fermion mass. You give me the mass, I can do everything else. Now, what do we do input here? Well, there are two particles really, nu and n. There is nu and n. Two particles. I'm sorry, for each generation, two particles. So, in other words. This must be the input. And then, imagine that I can, from here, compute M Dirac, which is Yukawa Dirac times V, or theta. What will this decay? Here, the decay is the Higgs particle decaying. Here, the interesting thing is a new particle N, which I suggested, which will have this spectacular decay. But the gamma, and decaying into EW, gamma decaying in bar into, and decaying into E bar, W minus, would be proportional to theta square, MN. Maybe some other factor, but that's for sure. But what is theta? <coughs> is M zero. So this is proportional to M Dirac squared. So if I want to make predictions, I need to compute M Dirac. You can tell me, why don't you try to do that? Just take the square root here. OK? You, you are with me? From here, you can imagine that MD is going to be um, MD should be, I hope I get it right. Is this correct? So then M Dirac transpose would be square root of M nu, square root of Mn. 
right? Because they are symmetric. Remember that new, uh, uh, my random mass matrix is symmetric. So that would this solve it? Let me put it back. M Dirac transpose the square root of M nu. Yeah, it would work. There will be a factor Y, I'm sorry. Let's plug it in. What would I get? M nu? Please check with B as I'm doing it. I square is minus 1. Then I will have M Dirac transpose square root of M nu. Square root of Mn. 1 over Mn. Square root of Mn. Square root of M nu. This cancels. Okay. So what I get is minus square root of why am I calling it? Yeah. M nu square root of M nu. Why do I have a minus sign? Oh, because there was an overall minus sign. Sorry, so it's plus one. So I'm checked. M nu is a square root of M nu, square root of M nu. This is the definition of square root of M nu. This is what I mean by square root of a matrix, okay? Something that when I square, I get a matrix, okay, obviously. That's, that's a generalization of the square root of a number, okay? It's not easy to work with square root of matrices. I, I we had to do in recent year um, a lot with my collaborators, Memeshek uh, and especially Vladimir Teo. Uh, it's sort of, it was all a how to, you know, lose your fear and learn to love square roots. Uh, it can be done. So it's true, right? This solves the... So you're saying, okay, it's not a big deal. Someone will measure for you, man, if you really produce this guy as a collider. Someone will measure M nu. How do we measure M nu? That's not in oscillations. And of course, the physical process, right? Because inside is masses and mixing angles. These things are measured through a associated physical process. Okay. This sort of light, we can come and remind ourselves. This is a task of low energy physics. This is today what is being done. It's a probe of neutrino mass matrix. That means masses and mixings. Remember, I can always work in the basis in which, say, charged leptons are. It's a matter of language. Uh, the Kaviba rotation is relative. Same the lepton rotation. You can say I work in the basis of charged lepton being diagonal. We'll always work in that basis. In that case, this is what the experiment will throw. This is masses and mixing angles. So this I would get from oscillations. And this somehow I will get at the collider, let's say LHC. Give me somehow this guy N, and I will be able to study its properties. I will know how it mixes, and I will know its masses. This is what the colliders do for us. Right? What did Collider do for W and Z? He found out how it couples and he measured its mass precisely. And he's doing now for the Higgs. Finding out how it couples and probing its mass. However, there is a catch. Whereas in the case of charged fermions, you give me a mass, I can uniquely determine Yukawa. There is one-to-one -one correspondence. Unfortunately, here it fails. Because, look at this. Let me put O there. What will happen if I put O here? There would be O transpose here. You, you agree? And there would be O where? Here. So what I will have here would be O transpose O. I'm just taking some matrix O. Okay. You follow it, please? This is very important. If I put O here, there will be O transpose here. 
So if I go on, there'll be O transpose here, there'll be O here. So I'm going to have O transpose O. This will work as long as this is one. So in other words, there is a serious arbitrariness in the CISO mechanism. I cannot disentangle it. I cannot invert it. Whereas for charge fermions, it was trivial. You give me a mass, I invert it. Or give me the coupling, I'll give you the mass. And vice versa. There is one-to-one -one correspondence here. Unfortunately, not only there is a one-to-one. -one. This is a terrible ambiguity. Because in general, this is complex. As long as this is orthogonal, O can be complex because these are all complex matrices. There is nothing real in the standard model. You have a couple of in general are complex. There may be CP violation. As Nicolas asked. For example, we know that Yukawa couplings of quarks are complex. Presumably also leptons. We have no proof. We are going to investigate that. In general, I have a tremendous ambiguity of a complex orthogonal matrix. By the way, a uh, uh, real orthogonal matrix is a small. The elements of orthogonal matrix are less than one. Right? If I... If I write a real orthogonal matrix, how would it look? Cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine. The elements of orthogonal real matrix are numbers less than one. The squares have to end up to one. But for example, if it's complex, this is also a total matrix. Cosine hyperbolic. Maybe I. You should help me. I don't know if there is a relative factor or why. But this is orthogonal, up to a sign here. No different vector. Huh? No different vector. No. I mean, cosine square minus. Cosine hyperbolic, sorry. Cosine hyperbolic. It's hyperbolic of some, how we will call it, alpha. Why not I write in a more CH alpha, ISH alpha? Um, cosine hyperbolic square minus sine hyperbolic square equal one, right? Yeah. Right, the terminal should be one. Yeah, so it's. Uh, you see, here I had to put a minus sign in order to get. But this is, this is orthogonal and it has a determinant one, I'm pretty sure. And you know this can be large. Cosine hyperbolic are not small. Mm. They are exponentials that can be as large as possible. So I, I have no idea what is going on. The ambiguity is terrible. The CISO mechanism is, is fundamentally... It, there is no way of probing it because I can make not a single prediction. You give me all the... Imagine that miraculous you manage to measure this completely. All the mixing angular masses and you give me all the mixing angular masses. And I fail completely. Okay, I have... I have Three times three, nine complex elements. This is the case with uh, uh, more than one. Yeah, there's a problem with more than one generation. In the case of one generation, I would know that mixing angle, right? That I was, there was just one M there, again, one man, but I, I have at least three generations. So even if I said, imagine that you tell me that, oh, huh, but I have this idea that I can explain genesis through the decays of these guys, they are very heavy and so on. You could make no predictions because, once again, the couplings are completely arbitrary, okay? It's sort of, it's, it's on, on many levels, the seasonal mechanism, to me, is completely unsatisfactory. It doesn't do the job it should do for us. One is, I don't have a way even, I don't know how to produce it. Once I produce it, I would know how to, to see the physics, but I could make not a single prediction with the seasonal mechanism. So I, for one, have to go beyond and let's say a few words about what we could do. Look, 
Suppose that someone sees neutral current in 1973. You and I could sit down immediately and say, oh, you see neutral current, so maybe there is a new scalar particle, you know, there is a new whatever. It would be trivial to come up with a model that explains that. What was beautiful about the standard model that it predicted necessarily the existence of neutral currents. And it tell you how strong they had to be. Remember what we found out in the standard model? This is why, this is why you like the standard model. This is why I like Einstein's theory of gravity, because it tells you how much the light will bend in the sun. So if I want to have a theory of neutrino mass, instead of adding new states and doing these models, it would be nice to have a theory that predicted neutrino mass. And I want to give you an example of such a theory. It, it, it all started with this. And that was the idea, actually the seed idea was, was done here. One of summer of 73 or 74 by Patti and Salam. It was followed by Mohabatra, Patti and Patti and myself. And this is the, uh, uh, Mohabatra and myself, and then I spent a lot of time. Yeah, their idea was, what if the world, this thing, this is the standard model. And there is this asymmetry, which is somehow unnerving. And it's interesting that one of the fathers of this asymmetry, Salam, was the one of the proponents said, wouldn't it be nicer if it looks like this? The world. Let's say a few words, what would that imply? Would it be nicer? If you don't feel it would be nicer, you won't appreciate the rest so much. Okay. So raise your hand. Who thinks this would be nicer? I'm curious. Okay, we got, we got a few hands. All right. I will do the same thing for the quarks, but let's not worry about the quarks at the moment. What does that mean? Well, the weak interactions are left-handed. So that means that here they go through some boson, which I call W, I should call it W+. plus. This cannot be the W boson going this. This must be a new W boson, you agree? Which I should call R. In other words, W plus minus it's often called in this theory WL plus minus. To emphasize that it works on left handed neutrinos. So, even before building a theory, I'll, I'll let you ask the question immediately. I would say the reason that I see the way the Weinberg and Glashow and these guys see the world is because these guys describe it. Before even I build a theory, if I get the idea, I can say, well, maybe it's not crazy. If this guy is heavy, the world will look as if there is no this guy in UR. Because I won't see this at all. But that's what we were going to ask. Before we go on, let's see what the gauge groove should be. Let's call it left-right. Obviously, it's SU2L. It's defined here when I tell you that the multiplet looks as a doublet, that means there is an SU2 symmetry. Okay. I'm also saying that there is SU2R, obvious, by definition. Remember the standard model, there is U1. And in the standard model, Q electromagnetic is T3 plus Y over 2. So we could ask the question, could this Y over 2 be the... In other words, I'm asking now, could QM be in this standard model? Left, right, T3 L plus T3 right. That would be beautiful, because if I could... I don't even have to introduce U1 if this were to work. Can this be true? In, in the standard model, I had to introduce U1 because the charges didn't come out right. And that's how we got neutral currents and so on, right? This is the story of the, of the rest is history. Once you got this idea, 96 to Glacier, the rest followed. Can I try this in the left right one? But I should try. Can it work? As you do. Break, so break completely, right? We'll break that symmetry, right? We will, well, we never break completely, you remember? The photon is masterless. Whatever we do. Or as it were, will be broken, yes. When, when but the world will, at the end, there will be a masterless photon. The symmetry is not broken completely. Because, okay, the, the example that we did for us, we do, uh, okay, I see, I see. Sorry, sorry. Oh, true. 
SU2 is broken completely. But because we have SU2 cross U1, U1 remains. Okay. True, true, true. Okay. True. A mixture of the two. This is broken completely, this is broken, but the linear combination say. No, unfortunately, this would have been even more beautiful. It cannot work because these charges are quantized. For example, if I look at the left-handed guys, from here I will produce that the charges, let's call them the left charges, would be plus or minus half. Because this guy will not contribute. By definition, T3R, when it acts on left, is zero. That's the definition of right. T3L, when it acts, so similarly, QR. Another beautiful theory killed by ugly effects of nature. Facts are facts. So I have to end U1. Let me call it Y prime. I call it Y prime because this is not the original Y. In other words, the charge now looks like Y prime over 2. But that means that this is. Because this formula is correct, that I've checked in the standard model, this, is, this works beautifully. So that means the hypercharge is a mixture of these two. Mm. This is quantized, but in the wrong way, or in the way we do not see it. Yeah, in the wrong way, yes, yes. It's quantized beautifully, but... But not as we it's, it, it hurts. It's similar. But the reason it may not hurt, you would see when I speak of grand unification at the end, Remember, even if this worked, I would have to think of strong interactions, and they, then this would not be a complete story. So if I want to have a complete theory, I will have to include strong interactions. And then maybe I can do without U1. Well, I can as well say it now, I may, I may have said it before. I'll remind you of this when we come again. At the moment, we don't need this. The standard model, we said it's very sad that it's SU2 cross U1. This U1 spoiled everything. But there is also SU3 color. Then I'll have to devoid it. I'll have to uh, uh, dedicate at least two, three lectures to that. Okay, we have to talk about it. If I want to unify, forget U1. Imagine that there was no U1. And the world was SU2 and SU3. You would have to unify. It. You would want to unify. It. Let's say you want to have a unified theory. What is the minimal theory that unifies SU2 and SU3? SU2 and SU3. SU3. It turns out to be SU5. But the rank of SU5 is 4. So actually, SU5 unifies also U1 automatically. And here, the charge is quantized. So this fact that it Quantization charge does not work. Maybe it's not so tragic. Maybe the answer will be in the next step, okay? That's enough. This is, I'm watering your mouth. This is what I would talk about if I give you this little course, a few lectures on the physics we understand. At the moment, I have to leave with this fact. Let's just see what this Y prime is. Remember how I compute the Y prime on a doublet? I gave you a trick. When you write Q as T3, plus y over 2, the sum of t3 is 0 on a doublet. So q up plus q down is y on the doublet. You remember this? This is the simplest way of computing the... Uh, so that means that your kava for the quark doublet was 1 third, 2 thirds minus a third, and your cover for the lepton doublet was minus one. Now, Yes. Sorry? You Please. You say you I really said that. <laughs> <laughs> what to do? Maybe I didn't write this <laughs> notation Q of Q. You know, the charge of Q, Q is a doublet. Remember Q is new E, uh, uh, up and down, sorry, and L is new E, new cow. So the tablet has hypercharges 
which is one third and minus one. That means, and by the way, here we have both doublets. There is a complete symmetry. So that means that y prime of quarks is one third. Y prime of leptons is minus one. In this theory, there are only doublets. Can you recognize what this is? This is actually a physical number. It's a more complicated theory, but you will see immediately everything is much easier to remember. Because of the left-right symmetry, you don't have to go through this gravy, you know, this atomic of left and right. This is actually a barrier number. And this is minus lepton number. So in other words, y prime is b minus l. So I have a first nice prediction, Q electromagnetic in this area. First, it's symmetric, and the one has a physical meaning. And you know, if I come up with the Majorana picture that we ended up with the seesaw, it tells me that it is deeply related to the symmetry breaking in this model. See, in the process of symmetry breaking, somehow B minus L is being broken, okay? And B minus L will affect in the barrier, in the lepton number, not the barrier number, in the theory, okay? So this is now, we are talking about the left-right theory. And we often one writes that G left-right is SU2L, cross SU2R. Course, U1. This is B minus L. This is the theory we are talking about. A any questions here? And there is two symmetry breaking process. There is a two symmetry breaking step. And they have to be really separated. Imagine that the, f that the scale of, the, in other words, at the first step, as Nicola said, WR should get a mass, but not WL. Uh, how do I know that it must happen? Well, I can imagine a limit when WR mass goes to infinity. That's called standard model. Therefore, in that limit, WL is not getting a mass. Therefore, there must be a new Higgs responsible for the... Uh, what, what, what are you saying? to symmetry breaking, why not 3, but, um, where the third choice is to break both them, both as you do? Or is it something no, like it will go like this, precisely, there will be G left, right. We'll have to break into G standard model, mm -hmm. because this is, I, I, I'm checking this as I speak, someone is sitting there at LAC and checking this, and we have now so much evidence that this is a correct theory at the energies of a weak scale, that we have to go through this stage. Whatever is the theory beyond the standard model, whatever you like, whether it's super strings, whether it's some grand unification, whatever it is, you're passing through the stage of the standard model. Okay. Whatever is the theory that Einstein wants to build, imagine Einstein sitting there, you know, breaking his head, you know, day after day, month after month, and going crazy, okay? Literally going crazy because in 1913, He's almost there. He and Grossman write a paper with a basically tensor theory of gravity. It's interesting to read you that. I'll send you that. A year later, he changes his mind. He thinks that gravity should be scalar and not tensor-like. Then he hears the Hilbert in thinking that he's tensor-like. Then he goes back to his ideas. Okay, this is how science, you know. Uh, uh, uh. He knows, however, whatever he does, he has to go through Newton. At low energies, he better agree with Newton. That's how he reasons. That's how you build the theory. So when Gleschow was building the standard model, he had to say, oh, I have to agree, agree with QED. That's a good theory. And that's how Gleschow got the neutral gauge was. And remember, we said there had to be a photon. And then Gleschow said, well, then there will be a Z boson. But you use the preceding knowledge. And therefore, this must be there. And this must be this at the scale MW. 
or maybe we can call it ML now because W is left-handed, breaks down into U1 electromagnetic. And this means that there is a new scale, call it MR or MWR. This scale has nothing to do with this scale. And we know today it's much about this scale. It's at least an TeV. And let's see, it has seen nothing of Okay, I can summarize for you if you want. There were a lot of theoretical debates in the 80s on the lower limit on WR. There was a theory. We started in 81, which said MWR is bigger than about 2 TeV. And there were a lot of debates whether this number is so good. Even I dirtied my hands with, with Tran and Mohapatra, and we came up with a slightly different number and so on. <laughs> And this went on until a few years ago, and the number was 2.53 TV. There was a lot of debate, a lot of interesting theoretical study. But now, there is LHC that says MWR is bigger than 3.5 TV. And in some interesting cases, even uh, close to 5 TV. One of the reasons that I, I had stopped working on the theory for a long time is because of that limit, there was no sense of working on the theory in the 90s, 80s. It would be empty talk. There was no way of, of testing it, okay? Now it becomes interesting, okay? Whatever is the new physical theory you're after, LHC is finally a machine that can test it, okay? We had to wait all this time because we knew that the scale had to be large. So, I would have to talk here what happens? I won't bug you much, okay? I don't think we are, this is a course on the standard model, we won't have to learn it deeply. <coughs> I will just give you some salient essential features for us to understand neutrino physics, neutrino mass. Question, maybe? No. Well, well Alex is saying that it's uh, 3.2, is there some like is there a limit to some process that they sure. have been detected on? Well, you look for WR. Okay. I mean, you, you, do simply, you do simply this. Let me remind you. Let me remind you. How did they see uh, WL? Through its decay or? They had a PP bar machine. So there was a, in a proton, U quark. In an anti-proton, there was an anti-down quark. This would give me W plus, say, mm -hmm. and then decay. Why don't we do the following? Let's call this P, sorry, down, P bar, U bar. Let me produce W minus. This is what you concluded. Then decays into an electron and the entire neutrino. It also decays into some quark, Q prime, or entire Q, whatever, W minus into Q bar, Q prime. Charm up, I don't care. That's how I see it. When, when I hit the resonance, the bright Wigner, remember how the cross section grows when you are, for an unstable particle, okay, there is an effect. Which, okay. When, when you Let me. About, uh, this W, we mean. Now I'm confused because we, we said that we separate them and we have no longer W which has both trailer. We have only left or right handed which separate. And you're saying that what we observe always is uh, is the left one. So for for this case, uh, that W must be left one or this is the SPS machine, the secondary 1983. This is how W was seen. Or well, let me call it WL. Okay. They saw it and they saw the decay. They saw both electron and neutrino. And you even computed one minus cosine theta factor, which I showed you. It's in your graph. You know how they saw it. You actually, your calculation is precisely what they've seen. But the point is, of course, that in order to, to see that, you have to sit on the particle. Okay, you produce the particle on shell. When you produce the particle on shell, the cross section goes up like crazy. Okay, this is sort of the behavior, right, there is. It's not a delta function? Yes, this is because of the decay, this? 
so here here we have the the the, the quartz which is also in the proton and the proton are the um, left hand so but well, uh, they are they are everything is in the proton left and right the guys that produce WL would be left-handed, sure. Mm -hmm. Well, U bar is actually right-handed. If I write like this, it's made out of a left-handed quartz. Mm -hmm. Now, they would do the same thing. Now you go to LHC. At LHC, at P, there is also DR. There is no P bar. And I'll show you that I'm going to actually have to tell you a little bit about uh, deep inelastic scattering, about, about the, uh, how they saw the quarks and so on. There is an interesting thing. As you go to higher energies, there are more and more anti-quarks. It's an interesting thing that you see. In the, that's why they, they don't need PP bar machine. It turns out that, that there is a lot of anti-quark inside the proton also. You should think of the proton, two up quarks, one down quark. You should also see the C of these particles and antiparticles. The quantum effects are very important. So, to be postponed for a week or so, there is also in P, there is also a U bar, or I can, U R bar. U first, U R, and then bar, which is U bar left hand. So that way I produce WR. The same way that we produce WL, now LHC produces WR. Da or doesn't produce. <laughs> I hate them. I, you know, I don't want the limit. I want them to see it. But I mean, but I mean also, here we're saying the limit is 3.5 TeV, right? Right, they don't see it. When you don't see something, you can put a limit. But we have, we have like, in galaxy, the center of mass energy is 40. Yeah, sure, they will be increasing it. Well, it so it's supposed to be like, like 14, no? They will all, you can say they can even get to the 14 GV, but the problem is that the quarks don't take, you have to divide this by the, uh, they don't take all of that energy. Okay, 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 I see. It's, it's LHC, it's not there, we'll, we'll say a few words about that, okay? They, are, they, are, they can actually do a pretty good job, they can go with WR, the, the estimates that they go even to 7 TV roughly. You have to see now how much energy typically would be in the quarks. It will not be all of the proton energy. Uh, but so one day we hope the, 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 the limit, so this is the outcome of, of LHC. Sorry, I interrupt. No. Okay, and WR today we know is bigger than 3.5 TeV. And it goes all the way to seven, there are claims even maybe 8 TeV could be seen. I don't know if discovery could be made. You see, one thing is seeing a particle, okay? The other is to have enough of events to, you know, proclaim the discovery if you measure precisely the masses, the spin, and everything else, okay? That may stop about 6, 7 TV. I can look it up for you. So this is very interesting what is happening in the next 10 years, okay? This limit is gonna be pushed up, and I, for one, would hope that they find it, but I'm betting. Okay. In, this, in this case, we will have WR, which also can decay to uh, sure. uh, right-handed in neutrino. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. I'll have to talk about it <laughs> immediately. But it can decay. Now, you may say, well, I don't know the mass of the right-handed neutrino. It's hard to see. It will surely decay into the quarks, and they don't see this. The quarks are very easy to see. They are called jets. Okay, again, when I discuss QED, I'll have to remind you, Alexei talked about jets and stuff like that. Okay, they don't see it. By the fact that they don't see it, they put a lower limit. Yes. LHC is putting all kinds of lower limits on the new physics. Supersymmetric partners, uh, WR, whatever you imagine, but I LHC think, is putting okay. limits. But I think because uh, the, um, the particle that you, you, we talked about in is it's very heavy and it's neutral, so if you have like a very huge amount of missing energy... Oh, no, 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 now, now I come to that. No, I come to that in a second. I come to that in a second. This is just the, the, the limit. Now we want to talk about... I don't really want to talk about quarks. I want to talk about the freeness, as you say. I will come to that. Right now. The point is... I'll just give you a flavor today and I'll have to maybe say a little more. Let's do the following. I'll tell you the minimum, and you ask me questions if you want to know more. Okay, so they don't get carried away or something that is sort of the physics that I care a lot about, but you may feel that maybe I'm biased. The reason I 
really feel that you should learn this theory. You could say, well, that's because you are one of the people that worked on it, developed it, and I'm considered one of the fathers. I would say it's the other way around. The reason that I have worked on it is because it has something deep and profound to me. One thing was the left-right symmetry. In other words, it sort of explains to the origin of parity violations for spontaneous symmetry breaking. It has to happen the way Nicolas uh, asked. There is a heavy new scale where this symmetric theory becomes asymmetric. And if you can reach there, we will see a symmetric world, and that sort of would be the, uh, the I could call it Li and Yang dream, if you look at the original paper of Li and Yang, 1956, that shows that parity is violated at the last page. It's beautiful, they say they cannot believe that deep down parity is broken. Yes, they think it is broken, but there will be one day a more fundamental theory in which parity will not be broken, and this will be the minimum such theory. But more important for us, for you and me, this now, this theory, when you have this left-right symmetry, it says if there is left, there is right. That means immediately there is this gap. So neutrino is massive. The prediction I came up with neutrino is massive. And this was a curse of the theory because everybody believed in the 70s the neutrino is massless. And this is why we should take it seriously for, for the basic reason why. You see, when the electron gets the mass, there is a complete symmetry. Now this guy will get a mass. There is no not any more a question of not having a right hand neutrino is there. So two important things that image emerge from here. One is neutrino is massless, massive. A second thing is this is how the CISO mechanism emerged in the context of left right cement. The original papers of Minkowski and Wapater and myself were actually done in the context of left right cement. They come up from other mechanisms, but the original work came from here. So we have both neutrino mass and left right with a proviso. What happens at this stage, at the first stage? This is what is a rule of thumb. When you have a new gauge group, let's say some grand unified theory or whatever, and you break the symmetry to the standard model, what you can imagine, all the particles that do not belong to the standard model get a mass. This is what I mean by symmetry breaking at a large scale. The particles that are protagonists in the standard model, electron, W, and Z, they will be massless. So that means here that the massive particle at this stage, massive, will be WR. Remember that in this theory there are two S2 groups. So if there is a Z boson, there is a Z prime boson. People often call it Z prime or ZR. Who else? N, this right handed neutrino. N is not a particle in the minimal standard model, it gets a mass. I, I, if you would have questions next week, I could show you what really happens, but please now learn it. N. And all these masses must be related to each other. You see, I was telling you that in the CISO mechanism, the standard model, which I really had no reason to introduce new R. Now have a reason, it must be there. And this is how it actually happened. We didn't do it in the standard model, we did it this way. Not only that N, I argued N should be heavy. Well, it here ends up being heavy. So in other words, MN, or I called it MN, is proportional to MWR. So if I go to the limit of the standard model, W mass, mass goes to infinity, so does Mn. When N mass goes to infinity, of course, neutrino is massless. Because M nu, well, let's write the formula M nu, remember, M data transpose 1 over Mn, M data. When Mn goes to infinity, this goes to zero, okay? This is why you would say, aha, I know why neutrino is massless in the standard model because we broke parity completely and it's not 
Here we have a physical picture of what is going on. The world is actually left or asymmetric. The only thing is that's happening at the large scale. And this happens because parity breaking is spontaneous. And now I just tell you what the, uh, you will take my word for it, what will happen. Now you can just relax and, and see whether this could be the reason that you want to learn more. You decide for yourself. This sounds nice, but it's not sufficient, okay. What is crucial is what, what Mahmoud was saying. You see, that means that there is an interaction, WR plus, N R bar, gamma mu E R. You agree, there was W L, or what I call W, new L bar, gamma mu E L. There was this interaction with a strength G square root of 2. That means there will be a disinteraction also. By definition, that means when I produce WR, And this is the fundamental difference with the seesaw mechanism. In the standard model, this was words. I said there is a man particle. I don't know actually why it is there, who it is. And I, ca I cannot produce it. Okay, now what is happening? If I believe in the theory, I will automatically produce M if I produce WR. So it will look the way you anticipate it. I have my down quark, anti up quark. Producing WR. What will happen? WR will produce, this is WR minus, so I will produce the electron. Here yeah, I will produce N. But N will decay. N is a heavy particle. And remember what we said N is crazy. And cannot decide whether it's a particle or antiparticle. So half of the time it decays into an electron, half of the time. So it means half of the time it will decay like this. It will give you another electron. It will decay very quickly, so WR. I don't need a small mixing through the seesaw, okay? For example, there will be this decay. And here there will be some quarks, which I can call jets. So you will, you will produce uh, the LAC, lepton plus lepton, same sign. Notice this is very similar to neutrino double beta decay. In, in neutrino double beta decay, in the nucleus, something crazy happens, and you get two leptons, two electrons. So if I think of the electrons, if you wish, sorry, let me just, of course, there will be other leptons. I will produce ER plus ER plus jet plus jet. I could see directly lepton number violation at the colliders. Not just indirectly. This is the, what I said, that we suggested with Kyung. The Kyung is the guy that you use, with my, my collaborator, whose form of Kobayashi Maskawa matrix. Now, why is this very important? Was there a question or yes and me? Yeah, those Gs are not the same, right? Well, Remember, the theory is left asymmetric. Okay, we can go to an energy where this... Uh, it, they start being the same. And of course, when you're saying if I have two energies, there may be some difference because the couplings run. Is that what you mean? At the original scale, but the world is left asymmetric, at the scale of WR, they must be the same. By definition. This is what I mean by the left asymmetric theory. That it's, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a tautology. Okay, when I say left asymmetric, I mean left asymmetric. Of course, couplings can be equal only at some energy. Everything is energy dependent, okay? But remember, couplings uh, change logarithmically. That's a very minor change. <coughs> so, okay, there, there could be some, because this scale is different from this scale, okay? Strictly speaking, there could be some minor difference. I will, I will uh, because I will talk about QCD, I will have to talk about running, and I'll give you the formula and so on. I will, I will let you appreciate the running. 
and see how much it changes. We get a feel for that. It's very small unless you go through a sort of span, so large, uh, uh, what we call a desert of energy. So you have to go to very high energy to see a really appreciable effects. Because the running of course is proportional <coughs> with how big the coupling is. In QCD that happens reasonably quickly because the coupling is big. Okay. <coughs> no. So, so, so two things I wanna sorry. I just want to uh, Yes, please. Um, you said that we have we can see the value number relation. Left or number relation. No, not barrier number relation. Notice I will start with forks, I will end up with forks. I will show you there is no barrier number violation. It cannot be because when in the case only left or number can be violated. But in the intermediate step we we violate the the barrier number, right? In the no. Where? Here, barrier number is zero. Okay, okay. Yes. And at the end, it will be barrier number will be zero because with this guy decays, there will be always quark and anti quark. That's how W decays. Remember, there was a theta mixing. This can also decay into through WL. Okay, I don't have to really say through some W. We can talk about this detail. Okay, I may tell you just a little more. So you see, this is delta L equal to. I'll have to say a few words more, okay? I won't finish today. There are two things. One is we can see directly left on number violation. Now, when I, and, and more than that, it, as a difference from low energy processes at, at the collider, you can measure the masses. Right? You measure the, what is the mass of WR? You measure the momentum and energies of the external states and you reproduce the mass. You can even measure the mass of N. When this is the case, you isolate these three body state. Yes. So the, the importance of a collider, of course, is what low energy physics cannot give us, is that we can find the properties of the new messengers and new. So we could have, and there will be a deep connection with the neutrino as double beta decay. Mm -hmm. on, on Monday, I'll tell you a few words. But more than that, because this guy is by Rana, actually half of the time it will decay decay into the E bar. Now, this particular process is very clean because there is no background, we say, in the standard model, there is no lepton number violation. So this is very clean, uh, people are looking into it. But we will also see E plus E bar plus jet. There will be some different jets. Charge is conserved. Therefore, we could see two things, lepton number violation, and we could see that then is my runner. It could be probed. Now maybe I should stop here because it's getting late and I don't want you to get tired. And I will have to say, before I ask Nicolas, if I claim they have a good theory, I should solve the problem of the arbitrariness of the seesaw. Remember that the seesaw has a terrible arbitrariness. I couldn't make any prediction, okay? If this is better, I should be able to get rid of that arbitrariness. I'll, uh, I'll come back to it one moment. Nicolas, so now we will have only two Higgs doublets to break. Hey, we have. And then we will introduce more to our couplets to mass of fermions and. Very good. Too much things. <laughs> when you go beyond this, that's going to be your choice. You want to work on a theory beyond the standard model, there's going to be more Higgs. That's. There is not, the beauty and simplicity that we found in the standard model of a single kick giving everything, it's gone if you go beyond the standard model. So if that's really appealing to you, then you wouldn't worry about physics beyond the standard model. I'm only in the world would you do that. Then I don't want you to, that, that some of you will complain about that and then you end up working on strings in which you say that there are infinitely many <laughs> new states. Okay. But it's okay if there are infinitely many, but you don't like that there are two more or something. Okay. That bugs me, okay. If you don't want to do anything, if this is Robinson, then you stay in the standard model, okay. Now, what would be the minimal Higgs, just when you ask? For example, I have to give the mass to the fermions, to the, to the electron. No, not today. No, sorry. Why? Yeah, I don't want to stop. It's hard to stop. 
Feynman says, I don't know if you've seen, I think he was in his first volume, when he talks, talks of the principle of minimal action. He said, I had a great teacher who knew how to stop in high school, and this helped me a lot. He says, I wish I knew how when to stop. Now, when I listen to Feynman, I feel that he knew when to stop, and I wish I would, you know, I feel like going on and on. I want to go into May and June, go after you in the cafeteria and tell you a little more, you know, the things that you carry all your life. <laughs> I try. Any last question? Not that you didn't ask questions, just in case that something that could be useful. Just a comment. Public. Yes, please. Now you can see that uh, I think it's more um, elegant or more nice as we s you asked us. <laughs> Well, what, what I want to, I'm glad that you say that, but I want to tell you something more. I claim at the end, and it took me a long time, that we can do, and this is work that I've done mostly with Teo, with mission before, and with Teo in the recent time, is, is that if this is really good, forget that it looks nice and elegant, it should be predictive. In order to be predictive, it should be the way Weinberg did in the Sun and So even if I have more Higgs, if at the end of the day I can do what he did, then you can say, okay, I forgive you, because I can test your... Yeah. Okay. So don't worry about complexity, apparent. Because if you look at natural theory of gravity, it's very complicated and you know, it's scary in the beginning and you don't want to do it. But at the end, what you like that it's a in spite of what apparent complexity is quite predictive. In certain regimes, of course, it's not easy to predict it at very high energies and so on when the coupling gets strong. But at large distances in a small field, we know how to do calculations. Actually. So, yeah, this is what this you should appreciate. About, that we can predict those two things together from these two processes. And this this is is the, the thing which is very important, that not only I predict a new physics that I can test, so you tell me how do you know that right handed neutrino is the origin of the mass, because I will produce it, I will study its properties, I will check the seesaw mechanism. More than that, I should be able to find this deep connection. This was a thesis of Theo, so if someone gets interested actually, he did a great job in connecting this. I could give you one to one, in the standard model this is some process by itself. So. I, for one, would argue this is what I try to do in research. This is what I would argue is good physics. When you can correlate different physical processes, which look apparently completely disjoint, this is what we call good physics. This is what we are after, you and I. To try to see a single common origin in apparently disjoint phenomenal nature is. That's what physics is, okay? This theory has a the potential of doing that. And of course, we can talk of some other uh, one, by the way, theory that could do something si similar. Unfortunately, it has too many parameters. It's minimal supersymmetric standard model. And if I give you a little course or something, it would be also nice if I do it after you learn some supersymmetry, because I could explain to you why you are learning supersymmetry. You will not have any idea by taking the course, because it's going to be very formal. I could give you a little flavor what it means from a practical point of view. And why this is very beautiful on one side, and also unfortunately very ugly because there are too many parameters. Supersymmetric model has all these super partners. They carry their masses and mixing, and it's just too much. So the 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 measure of beauty, I think, has to be predictivity and minimality. Therefore, when people say, "Oh, standard model is ugly because of this and that," okay, I think this is a terrible and wrong way of thinking because. the simplicity and predictivity of that should be put as a, as a first and most important criteria. Okay, and on the, my last words. I can turn this off. Right. <laughs>